American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stupidest episode ever of American Timelines. I don't appreciate that. I'm Amy. No, you're Joe. I'm Amy. You're Amy? Yep. Oh, man. I'm having an identity crisis. Okay. And you're the better looking one. Well, thanks, babe. Yeah. And now we are going to get to another episode of American Timelines by History for Jerks. After a while. Sorry, it's been a while again. Yeah, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and we are busy trying to save our careers, and Amy's trying to save the children. Mm-hmm. Or something like that. Yep. So, yeah, we're sporadic. We're going to try to get back to regular someday. Um, we're going to finish out this season, and we left off with crazy things happening in the end of September of 1969. That's right. We only have three more months left of 1969. Yes. Probably this episode and one more. Yeah. Because I think we're going to get through October and some of November. So, yeah. Uh, buckle in. Buckle up. Here we go. All right. What's first? October 4th, 1969 was a Monday. Mm-hmm. I mean, a Saturday. Okay. I get Mondays and Saturdays mixed up because they're both so much fun. Anyway. Uh, on that day, Diane Linkletter... The 21-year-old daughter of popular TV show host Art Linkletter died after falling or jumping, Uh juries out, from a window of her sixth-floor apartment at the Shoreham Towers in West Hollywood. How old was she? 21. Oh. Diane had made regular appearances on her father's show during the 68-69 season. The elder Linkletter attributed the death to his daughter's use of hallucinogenic drugs specifically lsd Mm. he told reporters it wasn't suicide because she wasn't herself it was murder she was murdered by the people who manufacture and sell lsd oh boy he clarified in an interview with the la times that diane was already somewhat emotional and dramatic that she had confided in him that she had experimented with lsd five months earlier and had a bad experience and that she had apparently had taken the drug again hours before calling a friend and her brother to say that she was terrified the tragedy would become part of an urban legend that during the LSD trip, Diane had jumped because she believed she could fly and would be cited in debates over stricter controls over illicit drugs for a long time. And then All they used that Wikipedia. they used that in that after school special too, remember? I think so. Yeah. It was yeah. about pot, I think though. Yeah. I and remember some girl falls out of those, the, window, out the window. I remember out the window. a girl like like feeling like she got spiders all over her or yes. something and scratching out her veins and stuff. I remember I did not want to do any drugs when I watched that. It was so whatever. ridiculous. It worked. It did its job, I guess. Yeah, I guess. And then in college, I realized, boy, those drugs are awesome. <laughs> Just kidding. And then Sunday, October 5th, 1969, Monty Python's Flying Circus first appeared on BBC One at 10.55 that night. The first show was described in the news as the latest late night show, which will, which will we are warned be nutty with John Cleese and Graham Chapman. Was well, that was those were the only ones on there at the fir- at first? That's who they build. As first oh, okay. Two, yeah, I think. Um, Wednesday, October eighth, nineteen sixty nine. The rights to employ St. Louis Cardinal center fielder Kurt Flood were traded to the Philadelphia Phillies as part of an exchange involving seven players. Flood, however, did not want to leave St. Louis, where he had built a profitable business as a portrait painter. Oh. I don't know if you knew that guy. No. So he announced first that he intended to retire from baseball, but soon became the first player to challenge the nearly century-long practice of teams trading players without the player's consent. Before the 1970 season was to begin, Flood would file an antitrust lawsuit that, while ultimately unsuccessful, would lead the way for the players to strike successfully for the right to free agency. Okay. Where players can pick where they go now. Oh, it does now. Is that just baseball or does football do that too? Yeah, football does that too. But can you imagine like if somebody, yeah. if your school just said, okay, we're going to trade you to a, yeah, a, they, a school they in Denver. Yeah, they do that. Teachers? They don't do it in, in Denver, but they do that in 
the county. They do it everywhere else except for Denver. They, well, in the county, you don't have to relocate. But I'm saying in baseball, it's like yeah. you have to move to another city right. if you want to keep making money. Right. I gotta take my whole family and leave. Like, what if I, you know, I chose to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. But yeah, that's why free agency is good, and people mm-hmm. can't complain. Um, and then October 9th, nineteen sixty nine was a Thursday. Mm-hmm. Uh, shortly after Pittsburgh Pirates manager Don Hoke was fired, mm-hmm. he he witnessed his brother in law's car being stolen from the driveway of his of the Hoke house. Hoke got into his own car and gave chase, and he suffered a heart attack during the pursuit, but managed to stop his vehicle at Amberson Towers just before collapsing. And he laid in his car for 20 minutes without anyone interceding. A doctor who claims he had been driving behind Hoke at the time eventually got out of his own car and performed cardiac massage, which I didn't know was a thing, before an ambulance transported Hoke to the hospital. However, despite efforts to save his life, Hoke died 10 minutes after arrival. Mm. Jill Corey would claim for decades that her husband had died of a broken heart because the pirates had passed him over. Oh, yep. So he, yeah. So he ran out and had a heart attack. Yep. Well, isn't that something? Isn't that crazy? Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, I got fired and then I had a heart attack after somebody was stealing out my car. And then Friday, October 10th, 1969, on the advice of National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger. U.S. President Richard Nixon issued Secret Service orders to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to comment to commence Operation Giant Lance, the sending of bombers mm-hmm. armed with nuclear weapons toward Moscow in an effort to convince the Soviet leaders that he was not reluctant to launch a nuclear war in an effort to end the ongoing Vietnam War. A squadron of 18 B-52 bombers, each carrying nuclear bombs, would be sent out on October 27th. The mission was so secretive a historian would write in 2008, after the orders had been declassified, that even senior military officers following the orders were not informed of its true purpose. The cable from General Earl Wheeler, the JCS chairman, to eight commanders began with the words, We have been directed by higher authority to institute a series of actions to test our military readiness in selected areas worldwide to respond to possible confrontation by the Soviet Union. Hmm. Secret missions yep. that nobody heard about till 2008. I'm sure, well, there's some more going on now. Yeah. That's scary that Trump can just do that. Mm-hmm. Do those things. Tuesday, October 14th, 1969, one of the first major acts, one of the first major acts of the U.S. of the animal rights movement, activists broke into the Bio Research Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and released 3,000 hamsters that had been used in disease research. Oh. The spokesman for the Institute said that the act had ruined years of research into medical problems and, and that none of the hamsters could be matched up with their testing records. Hmm. Isn't that a mess? Yeah. And then all, now you got all these diseased hamsters with all kinds of diseases running around. Well, I don't know if... I mean, I don't know if they were contagious diseases. You don't know? Nobody knows. I mean, you can't catch... I don't think you can catch diseases from hamsters. Well, October 16th, 1969 was a Thursday, and the New York Mets defeated the Baltimore Orioles in Game 5 of the World Series, 5-3 to three, to complete one of the most memorable upsets in baseball history. Mm. That particular Orioles team was considered to be one of the finest ever. The World Series win earned the team the name the Amazing Mets and the Miracle Mets as they had risen from the depths of mediocrity because the 1969 team had the first winning record in Mets history. This was the first World Series of MLB's divisional area era when they had divisions. The Mets became the first expansion team to win a division title, a pennant, and the World Series, winning in their eighth year of existence, becoming the fastest expansion team to win a World Series up to that point. Okay. You excited about baseball? No. Friday, October 17, 1969, 14 black members of the undefeated University of Wyoming Cowboys football team were kicked off the squad by head coach Lloyd Eaton when they came to talk to him at his office while wearing black armbands. Mm-hmm. The players had come in to talk to the coach at his Laramie, Wyoming office about wearing the armbands as a protest during the next day's game against the all-white and all-Mormon Brigham Young University team. Mm-hmm. Accounts of what happened next differ, but all 14, including five starters, were barred from playing again during the argument that followed. 
A lawsuit by the players against Coach Eaton and the university would later be dismissed. As for the Wyoming Cowboys, they beat BYU the next day without the 14 players and another team the following week, uh, and they would lose their final four games. But they would lose their final four games. Eaton would quit at the end of the 1970s season after the Cowboys finished 1-9-0. and Two of the players, Tony McGee and Joe Williams, would go on to careers in the NFL. Why do you keep telling me about sports? God, can't we... Can't yeah, but we, I mean, that's a thing. Like, black players wanted to stand up, and yeah. they got, you know, that's a thing. That's true. Like, that's a big thing. Like, if that happened today, uproar would be They tried insane. to protest peacefully, and they get Well, they got let go. Crucified. So it's like, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I didn't know that happened until I read it. I was like, jeez, I, I didn't know that happened. That's uh, Just open a door in our podcast and just slam the door yeah, shut. Yeah, really. Uh, at least she's taking our dog out. I know. That's our son taking our dog to go potty. It's raining. They won't go on their own. You got to force them. Mm-hmm. And then on Saturday, October 18th, 1969, we got a new song on the number one spot of the Billboard charts, The Temptations, I Can't Get Next to You. Um, I'm trying to think how that goes. Can't get next to you. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but uh, yeah. it's it was something like written that. by Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong for the Gordy label. The single was the second of The Temptations' four number one hits, on the U.S. pop charts, it was also one of the best-selling singles the group released. Billboard ranked it as the number three song for 1969. The applause that starts the song, which is cut short by Dennis Edwards' spoken "Hold it, hold it, listen" line, was sampled in another Temptation song, "Psychedelic Shack." Oh, I can't get next to you. No, that's not how it goes. I'm thinking of something else. Yeah, I think you are. Anyway, those of you who know it, sing along in your car. We'll take a little break and let you sing and go. <laughs> Oh, that wasn't very good. Wednesday, October 22nd, 1969, the voice of the Zodiac Killer was heard on television for the first time as a murderer telephoned during a live broadcast of the Jim Dunbar Show. Okay. Do you know about this? Do we talk about this? I think so. Go ahead and say it. It was a morning program on San Francisco's KGO-TV. Dunbar's guest was the famous criminal defense attorney, Melvin Belly, mm-hmm. and the first call came in at 710 as the caller threatened to commit more murders if he wasn't allowed to talk to Belly on the air. Belili? Is it? Oh, Belly. Uh, in all, Zodiac called five times over a 90 minute period. Starred for attention. Yeah. That's what these murderers are. Mm-hmm. And then Friday, October 24th, 1969, Paul McCartney of the Beatles appeared in public for the first time since the Paul is Dead rumor oh. that had been circulating for several weeks, bringing an end to the speculation that clues to his apparent accidental death had been included in backward messages within Beatles songs and images on albums. Did you say bringing end to that speculation? Isn't it still going on? Uh, yeah, I guess. I, <laughs> I think people have stopped for a while. Okay. But paraphrasing the late Mark Twain, Mark McCartney told reporters, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> it's all according to Wikipedia. Yeah. October 31st, 1969 was a Friday. Sam Walton's chain of Walmart discount disc departments. Ugh. Sam Walton's chain of Walmart discount department stores was formally incorporated. Shares of stock in the company would first be offered to the public on October 1st, 1970, originally at the price of how much per share would you guess? Uh, 10 cents. $16.50. Duh. Um, a nickel. And that same day, the disappearance of Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley happened in Oscoda, Oscoda Michigan, when the two teenage girls, aged 16 and 15, respectively, vanished after choosing to walk out of classes at Oscoda High School. The two were apparently picked up by their killers while hitchhiking and were never seen again. I don't know about that one. You should have done that one. Well, I did a different one, so. Well, you could have done up this yours. One. Oh, up mine. I thought you were totally going to say, oh, those were the two that were murdered by the Habita 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 killer or the Mongol Cranberry killer. It could be. It could be somebody like that. Or the Shiitake Ham Bone. It might be. That might be. Well, that brings us to Saturday, November 1st, 1969, when Elvis Presley takes over the number one spot on the Billboard charts with Suspicious Minds. We can't go on together with Suspicious Minds. That was a 1968 song written and first recorded by American songwriter Mark James. Mm -hmm. After this recording failed commercially, it was cut by Elvis Presley and producer Chips Moman, becoming a number one song in 1969 and one of the most memorable hits of Elvis Presley's career. Yep. 
And that same day, TWA Flight 85 landed safely at Rome's Fiumcino Airport at 5.07 in the morning local time, Mm -hmm. 18 hours after it had been hijacked during a scheduled flight between two California cities. The Boeing 707 had departed Los Angeles for San Francisco when one of its passengers, Italian-born U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Raphael Minicello, Minicello, you're, you're, the, the Italian language is entered, just rolling off your tongue. Entered the cockpit with a carbine rifle and directed a six-member crew to travel eastward. With the crew held at gunpoint, Flight 85 had made stops in Denver, New York, Bangor, Maine, and Shannon, Ireland before Minicello landed in Rome and was transported out of the Italian capital by the chief of Rome's police, Pietro Gulli. Minicello then escaped into the Italian countryside, then made his way back to the city. Hours later, the native of Italy was captured by Rome police, who found Roman police, I assume what should say, mm-hmm. who found him shivering in his underwear near the ancient Appian Way. Italian courts declined request to extradite Minicello and convicted him on a firearms charge, for which he served 18 months in prison. What? That's all? Afterward, he remained in Italy. So he hijacked a plane and he only got 18 months? He took months. it all the way across the country and then over and was yeah. over. Like, but what I don't understand is if it was only going from San Francisco to what Los, I say, Angeles. Los Angeles, Los Angeles to San Francisco, how would it have enough gas? Like, well, they had said it stopped in Denver and then it stopped so in... The, but while he's got people at gunpoint, he's like, refuel this plane. That's like, why I always wonder, like, why couldn't they stop when he when they're stopping for gas? Why couldn't somebody... Like, somebody like, hey, he's got us a gunpoint. Yeah. You know, something. I don't know. Maybe they were too scared or they didn't... Ha- you know, it was in the 60s, so airports and airplanes were, I think, a lot different. Yeah, too. probably. Monday, November 3rd, 1969... U.S. President Richard Nixon addressed the nation on television and radio at 9.30 p.m. Washington time to announce his plans to end American involvement in the Vietnam War. Which was a lie. He gave his reasons for rejecting immediately removing all troops, framing that option as the first defeat in our nation's history that would result in a collapse of confidence in American leadership. Um, Instead, he talked about a plan to gradually Mm -hmm. uh, remove them and replace them with South South Vietnamese forces. And he he had some comment about, uh, he described the people who would support his plan as the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, um, in contrast to the vocal minority, which you always hear Trump repeat. Yep. Like he repeats that during Nixon. He, like Nixon was his hero. Yeah. And then Wednesday, November 5th, 1969, three American prisoners of war walked into a South Vietnamese militia outpost near Tam Kai a week after they had been freed from captivity by the Viet Cong. The three, all from southeastern United States, had walked for a week through the jungle after being set free. Oh, can you imagine? No. Nope. Walking a week through the jungle? Yeah. At, not, at gunpoint, probably? After you were a prisoner of war? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Friday, November 7th, 1969, uh, was the same day that Led Zeppelin only had, uh, Led Zeppelin had their one top 10 hit in the U.S. You know, they've only had one top 10 hit, Led Zeppelin? Really? And it was on this day, and it was Whole Lot of Love. Yeah. Which remained on the Billboard charts for 15 weeks and peaked at number four. It's a good song. Did you know that they stole it? I know there's another version. It was based off a 1962 Muddy Waters song called You Need Love. Oh, really? Yeah, written by the great Willie Dixon. The band sued in 1985 and courts ruled in favor of Dixon. And, like, if you hear it, Mm -hmm. uh, it's obvious it was a a ripoff. But actually, Jimmy Page, like the guitar riff that Jimmy Page Mm -hmm. did was different, but... Uh, Robert Plant was like, hey, I just, uh, he had that riff. It was so awesome. We're on a houseboat. We're playing, you mm-hmm. know, and I I had to come up with something. So, you know, I just, I sang that song, you know, and it, he was like. So that riff isn't in that original one? No, I don't think it's a little different, but the words are like exactly the mm-hmm. same. Um exact word yeah i can hear it already you've got yarning, you've got so 
Oh, yeah. Don't yeah, it's like the exact same word. Yep, anyway. Uh, yeah, and I had no idea that was kind of stolen. But that same day, you have something to tell us about, right? November 7th, yes. 1969? Yes. Yes, I am going to talk about the murder of Sister Kathy Sesnick. Oh, of wait the, a minute. This sounds familiar. Is yep. this, did we watch a We did. A the show? Keepers. Oh, it was a show called The Keepers mm-hmm. on Netflix. You remember that? Netflix? Yeah, I think so. Oh, uh, I definitely remember this one. The nuns. I thought this was when we started watching Forensic Files. No, we were watching this first, okay. I think. Ugh. I can't believe so, you got me hooked on some of those for a while. I, the, yeah. I don't know why I watched this. I hate so, murders. Anyway, anyway. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Go ahead with your so, awful murder. I'm, this, I, got, I got a lot of it from The Keepers, and then I got some of it from... I got a, a lot of it from Huffington Post. They had an article, too. Okay. By Ariana Laura Bassett. Huffington, shout out. Now, when you, uh, where can our listeners, when we're done with this, where can they go watch this documentary? Probably Netflix. Was it on Netflix? Is that where I think thought? so, yeah. So look for The Keepers. It was hot for a second. Like, when mm-hmm. we watched it, was like, yeah, everybody's talking about it. And then now it's just another murder. Yes. So well, we're gonna cover it. I don't know about that. We're going to cover it very half acidly for you. Yep, we are. So in November, that November, later than this date, I'm going to come forward for a minute. Okay. Um, Father Joseph Maskell. Okay. He was the chaplain of Archbishop Arch, Archbishop Keo High School in Baltimore. And we both have trouble talking, huh? Yes. He um, called a student into his office and suggested they go for a drive. Is a boy student or a girl? When student? the final bell rang at two forty p.m., Jean Hart Hargaden Wainer, a sixteen-year-old junior at the all-girls Catholic school, oh, girl. followed the priest to the parking lot and climbed into the passenger seat of his car. It wasn't unusual for Maskell to give students rides home or to take them to doctor's appointments during the school day. That's weird. The priest, then thirty years old, had been the chief spiritual and psychological counselor at Keo for two years and was well known in the community. Okay. Many Keo parents had attended Maskell's Sunday masses. He'd baptized their babies, and they trusted him. This time, though, oh, man. Maskell didn't bring Wayner home. He drove to the outskirts of the city. Eventually, he stopped at a garbage dump far from any homes or businesses. Maskell stepped out of the car, and she followed him across a field of dirt toward a dark green dumpster. Oh. It was then that she saw a body crumpled on the ground. What? The week prior, Sister Kathy Sesnick, a popular young nun who taught English and drama at Keo had vanished while on a Friday night shopping trip. Oh. People from all over Baltimore County helped the police comb local parks and wooded areas for any sign of her. Wayner immediately recognized the lifeless body as her teacher. It was Dr. It was her? That's what she That's what she recognized. That's what she says. I thought... And she said you could tell it was her. She wasn't that far gone. Yeah. Sesnick was still wearing her aqua-colored coat and maggots were crawling on her face. Uh. Wayner tried to brush them off with her bare hands. What was the guy doing? The priest guy. She said she 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 said she said help me get the, these off her, and she turned to Maskell and instead the priest leaned down behind her and whispered, "You see what happens when you say bad things about people." Ah. Uh. So then, Ma- she she realized she he was threatening her. Uh. So she decided she wouldn't tell anyone. Yeah. And she said he terrified me to the point I would never open my mouth. Yeah, she, she recalled, thought she was, she was going to be next. So two months later, the police announced that a pair of hunters passing through a dump outside of Baltimore had stumbled upon the body of the missing nun. Two months later, you're talking like January yeah. of 70. Yep. Sasnick had choke marks on her neck and a round hole about the size of a quarter in the back of her skull. Uh, An autopsy confirmed she'd been killed by a blow from a blunt object, probably wow. a brick or a ball-peen hammer. Yikes. But no one oh, came forward with hammer. information about the murder, and the police never solved it. Oh, that would hurt. Over the past few years, however, Wayner and other Keough alumni have begun piecing together their memories and talking openly for the first time in decades about the traumatizing things that happened to them in the wait, high school. Wait, when did this happen? Now? More like, recently. More recently? Maybe? Events they believe are connected to Sesnick's murder. And a group of them have launched their own investigation oh. in hopes of answering the question, who killed Sister Kathy and why? They should have started a podcast. Yeah, maybe they should. Sesnick was like a real-life version of Maria, Julie Andrews' character from The, Sil- the Sound of Music. Okay. She was um, very pretty. She was warm, exuberant. The nun played guitar and wrote musicals for the girls to perform on stage. I'm picturing the nun from the airplane movie. 
kind of. No, she was younger. Oh, well, she, she took her no, students. She was young. Remember oh, was playing she? The guitar and singing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I do remember. Yeah. Right. She took her students to see the 1968 movie version Romeo and Juliet after they read the Shakespeare play. She I think had, you're thinking of the grandma who talks speaks jive. In the oh, place, Barbara right? Billingsley. Yeah, yeah. She invented creative Sorry. vocabulary games to push the girls to teach each other new words. That's a nice thing to do. Sesnick lived in a modest apartment in southwest Baltimore with another nun, and her students would occasionally drop by in the evenings or on weekends. Well, there's the vow of poverty. You have to live yeah. in a modest apartment. So on Unless you're around 7.30 Stephen p.m. Furtick with Elevation Church and have 11 bathrooms. Right. That's true. Around 7.30 p.m. on November 7th, Sesnick told her roommate, Helen Russell Phillips, that she was going to swing by the bank and then shop for an engagement gift for her cousin. Wait, she was going to do that the same night that on the Brady Bunch, the kids are torn over whom to believe when Cindy's favorite doll, Kitty Carey, all disappears, and she says that Bobby took it that same <laughs> night? Such drama. Yeah. Yes. According to media reports from the time, she cashed a $255 paycheck at a bank, then drove to the Edmondson Village Shopping Center where she bought buns at Mu- Mui's Bakery. Oh, Mui's fresh Mui's Bakery. Buns. When she hadn't returned home by 11 p.m., her roommate, Phillips, called two priest friends who drove to her apartment and called the police. Later that night, Sesnick's brand new green Ford Maverick was found unlocked and illegally parked a block from her apartment. Mavericks are cool cars. Even though she sucks. had a designated parking spot behind the building. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. The car mm-hmm. placement doesn't. And she sense. wasn't, there was a, wasn't any sign of her anywhere. So, retired police report that the Catholic Church had a lot of pull with the police department at the time. Okay. Yeah, they would. The first person of interest in the police invest- investigation was Gerard Koob, a Jesuit p- priest. Koob, Gerard Koob, y'all. He was one of the priests Sesnick's roommate had called when she realized the nun had not returned from her shopping trip. Oh. And he had been the one to call the police to report Sesnick missing. Okay. Koob was in a romantic ra- relationship with Sesnick at the time. Two years earlier, before he was ordained and before she had taken her final vows, he had asked her to marry him. She turned him down, but they continued to spend time together and write each other love letters. Uh Uh-oh. And three days before Sesnick disappeared, Koob called her from a Catholic retreat to tell her he still loved her. He was prepared to leave the priesthood for her and hoped she'd leave the nunhood for him. Wow. The police brought Koob in for questioning, but he had an alibi for the night Sesnick had disappeared. Yeah. He and a fellow priest had gone to dinner in downtown Baltimore and watched Easy Rider at a movie theater afterwards. Easy Rider is a good movie. He produced receipts and ticket stubs and passed two lie detector tests. Okay. So the police. That's st- a, like, you know, that. Do you, do you think anybody judged them for watching that movie? Like, priest? A priest oh, watching Easy Rider? I don't it's know. like a biker movie with Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, right? I don't think anybody. So police had a gut feeling that Sesnick had been murdered by is someone it? with ties to the church. Is that the right movie? Maybe I'm thinking of Five Easy Pieces. You might be. I don't know. I don't know either of them. Police interviewed half a dozen priests who knew Sesnick as the investigation continued, and there was one in particular who kept whose name kept coming up, Father Maskell, who worked with Sesnick at Keogh. Police tried to interview Maskell a number of times about Sesnick's disappearance, but the priest always managed to elude him. Okay, yeah. Easy Rider was Jack Nicholson. You're not even listening. Sorry, Peter Fonda. And Dennis Hopper. All right. In Baltimore in 1969, <laughs> it was very difficult, if not impossible, to investigate a Catholic priest for any crime. Right. Would, Arch- you, would you be upset if I just happened to mention the time that my friend's dad thought Dennis Hopper was a real referee because he was in a commercial? Stop it. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> the Archdiocese of Baltimore is the oldest in the United States. Okay. And the church considers it to be the premier Catholic jurisdiction in the country. Baltimore is where it all started, huh? Yeah. The diocese is- More than half the city's residents identify as Catholic. Okay. According to That's the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, Baltimore City prosecutors have charged only three of the 37 Baltimore priests who have been accused of sexual abuse since 1980. Really? Just only two of three. those priests were convicted, and one of those convictions was overturned in 2005. Yikes, that's terrible. Yes. Yeah, there's, a, there's a podcast, a local podcast, about mm-hmm. the Charlotte, I mean... Diocese I or whatever? Yeah, who have been accused, and it's on w, it's WFAE. I can't remember really? the name of it, but it's, yeah... I haven't listened to it, but I... But Maskell in particular was a difficult target. Okay. At, t- at the time, he served as the chaplain for the Baltimore County Police, the Maryland State Police, and the Maryland National Guard. Okay. Maskell kept a police scanner and loaded handgun in his car, drank beer with the officers at a local dive bar, and often went on ride-alongs with his police friends at night and- to respond to petty crimes 
or catch teenagers making out in their cars. Yeah. Hmm. Investigators felt pressure from superiors to leave the priest and other members of the clergy be. Yeah, let them do whatever you want, they want. The case remained cold for two decades. Then, in 1994, two women came forward with bombshell accusations against Maskell that tied him to the young nun's murder. At this point, he's six. Yeah, he's in the 60s, I think. The 60s. Identified in court documents at the time only as Jane Doe and Jane Rowe, the women accused Maskell of raping them when they were students at Keough. The women filed a civil lawsuit against Maskell, the Archdiocese of Baltimore, the school sisters of Notre Dame who ran Keough, and a Baltimore gynecologist named Dr. Christian Richter seeking $40 million in damages. The women were too afraid of Maskell and his old police friends to use their real names back then, but Maskell died in 2001. And Jane Doe and Jane Rowe are finally ready to speak out publicly. Oh. Their names are Jean Wayner and Teresa Lancaster. Wayner, who claimed Maskell had taken her to see Sesnick's body before it was discovered by hunters, provided details about the body that were known only to investigators at the time, oh. according to the um, newspaper. Yeah, I believe her. Investigators were initially skeptical of her claim that Sesnick had maggots on her face because maggots are usually not present in cold November temperatures, but an autopsy showed there were, in fact, maggots on Sesnick's throat, a detail had, that had not been made public. Huh. Wayner said that for decades she'd buried most of her memories of what went on at Keough. She's, Gosh, can you imagine trying to yeah. live your life with that trauma? She started to remember sexual abuse in bits and pieces beginning in 1992. Oh, no. Although Lancaster had always remembered most of the abuse that occurred at Keough, she too had managed to repress some of the details until her mother died in 1993. Huh. Survivors sometimes misremember details of traumatizing events, but Lancaster and Wayner's accounts are corroborated by court records and interviews with eight other Keough students. Eight others, four wow. of whom claim they were abused by Maskell, and nice. another four who say they were able to fend off his advances. How terrible. What a terrible world. And, yeah. So, Kio was a traditional Catholic school where students were required to wear knee-length plaid skirts and shirts buttoned all the way up to their necks, but it was hardly immune to the 1960s counterculture. Former Keo students said that in Maskell's office in a nearby rectory where he lived, the priest offered the girls a relaxed, open-minded environment where they could talk freely about sex and drugs, oh, drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes on his sofa, and ask for help dealing with their traditional Catholic parents. Uh, Maskell was a charismatic young man in his late 20s when he started at Keo as chaplain in 1967, two years after it opened. Yeah. He also, and I said that, he served as a psychological counselor. Former Keo students said Maskell's used his charms psychology training and moral authority to f first disarm the young girls and then to manipulate them into sexual relationships. Uh, he targeted struggling or badly behaved students. Yeah, um, yeah, because they're untrustworthy, right? Mm -hmm. Lancaster said when she was a junior in 1970, she went to Maskell's office to talk to him about some problems at home because her parents had found marijuana in a joint in her bag or something. Oh, uh, there's nothing wrong with marijuana. Um. She said it was the middle of the day, and Maskell invited her into his office and shut the door behind her. He then um, stripped. He then proceeded to strip her clothes off and forced her to sit on his lap naked. He told her he was touching her in a godly manner, and so Jeez. like other girls, often the girls didn't realize that they were being raped and assaulted until months or years later. Uh. Um, when she and so Lancaster even believed for a short time she was in a romantic relationship with the priest. Uh. So, um, that's gross. Then there's other stuff Why that happens like where the other girl remembers there was a police officer that was involved, and oh, that rings a bell from the show. There of, was a yeah. gynecologist that was involved. Oh, and man, all this stuff. Gross. So, What's wrong with people. Um, so what how it ties into the nun's murder is that, um, some of the girls at the time went to confide in the nun where uh -huh. she kind of said, is he doing something to you? Oh yeah. And the girls said yes. And so she said, I'll, I'm going to take care of it. Yeah. She's going to report it so that he did. He can't do that anymore. And so she was dating him, right? Who? No, that, that nun was dating him. Not father Maskell. That was the part you weren't paying any attention about. I can't remember who, who was she dating? Oh, the other guy. Coob. Coob. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I was paying some attention, just not a lot. So they did try to um, go to court, but it didn't work. The Catholic Church said false memories aren't aren't a thing, and Ugh. um, let's see. 
But the police did investigate Maskell for rape and murder. The search for evidence came up empty until a Baltimore grave digger named William Story called police with a tip. Story, the groundskeeper at Holy Cross Cemetery, said Maskell had ordered him to dig a 12 by 12 foot hole in the graveyard in 1991 so the priest could bury a truckload of confidential files in it. The grave digger produced a hand-drawn map indicating the location of the documents. In August of 1994, the police exhumed the boxes, which were mostly filled with psychological evaluations of Keogh students Maskell had counseled. Um, this, This informant said at least one of the boxes also contained nude pictures of underage girls, which would have been enough evidence to arrest Maskell for possession of child pornography. Oh, man. But those pictures never made it into the evidence room. The detectives say they inexplicably vanished after the graveyard dig. And the newspaper reported only that Maskell's buried boxes contained psychological tests, evaluations, and canceled checks. Judge Kaplan, who presided over the civil trial, says the photos were never submitted as evidence and that he has never heard of them. So they just disappeared. Yeah. After, as police continued to search for evidence, Maskell proved just as slippery and well-connected as he had in 1969. Um, the the source of their information said that as soon as he started looking into the Cessnick case, he received a phone call from one of his superiors in the police department, and the guy told him to stay out of it. Leave it alone. Let it go. Yeah. Um, before police had a chance to question Maskell in 1994, he checked himself into a residential treatment facility, claiming he needed help coping with the stress and anxiety the case had caused him. Weeks later, he quietly checked himself out and fled to Ireland, where he continued to work as a priest. Really? Law enforcement... Law enforcement dropped the investigation once Maskell fled the country, and he died without ever being charged with a crime. Magnus had died years earlier in 1988. That was the other priest that oh. abused the girls with Maskell. Jeez. And Richter died in 2006. Man, those guys are in hell. Yeah. That's terrible. Ooh, sorry. That is not good. Those aren't good things to do. No. Well, and when you have the, when you're a trusted figure like that. That's what it is. Those are the ones that seem to be the worst. It's like you're in this place that no matter what, you're untouchable and nobody would ever believe you. And it's not, it's not that all priests are pedophiles. It's that pedophiles become priests because that's an easy access, easy way to access people. Yeah. Get people to trust you and do whatever. Mm -hmm. Or teachers probably or yeah but teachers are police maybe teachers don't really go to be into people's homes and stuff and they probably used to get alone time with kids and in the 60s they probably did though but yeah priests you're right that is the only place where you trust they trust it implicitly you know daycare yeah daycare workers or babysitters but or like direct care hospital nurses i hate to think about it it's probably yeah just sad like yeah i think there's so many places where you're supposed to be able to trust people. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Hopefully it's different, a little bit different now. I mean, now that it's so commonplace and in the news all the time. Yeah, like, that maybe it's hopefully harder. Hopefully people aren't trusting people anymore like that. Yeah. Um, well, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah, let's just leave it there. Okay. That was good. That was a good story. If you, yeah, go definitely check out that show. What's the it Keepers. Called? The Keepers. Uh, that was good. And it is like suspenseful and things. And I don't. You know, when you were telling us, right? Can't remember. There was a lot of it I didn't remember, but um, but it was really, I remember it being well done. I'm not mm-hmm. into that kind of stuff. Right, so yeah. Must be good. Anyway, thanks for listening. We got one more episode to end season four. Yes. And then we're going to regroup and figure out what we're going to do after season four. Yes. Uh, to kind of change things up a little bit, maybe. Correct. Right? Add some spice back in. Maybe change the format a little bit. Do something a little different. Something wild. Something wild. Don't get too... Don't get your oh, hopes up Oh, it's going to be much. crazy. There's going to be songs. There's okay. going to be guitar solos. I don't think so. There's going to be uh, prison visits where we talk to prisoners, maybe. Uh, that's not going to happen. Ghosts. We're going to talk to ghosts summers. Ooh, maybe we could do that. Add ghosts. Uh, Add Ouija board. Yeah, we could do a Ouija board every episode. So thank you for listening. We love you. <laughs> I have, we could open out the, cl- the show every time with a Ouija board. Yeah, and then random things, whatever it says. And we'll say, we'll tell you what it says. That's you know, right. Most times that's dumb stuff. We might Maybe we'll have guests on. Maybe we'll have Arthur Ash on to talk about tennis. Maybe. Never Is he know. still alive? No. Maybe we'll have Dan Simmons on as a guest. No. I'm sure there's somebody named Dan Simmons. Anyway, thanks for listening. We love you. We apologize about the erratic behavior. 
Yes. We know that doesn't... Joe apologizes for his erratic behavior. Well, it doesn't make listeners happy, and listeners drop off if you don't keep it. And I know. But it is a pandemic, and everything's up in the air. Yeah, that's right. Uh, But we're trying. We're trying to find time. It's really difficult. We love you. Thank you. Time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck Berry is here watching us. So get out of here, Chuck Berry. We're so tired of hearing about the six days. I said, we're so tired of hearing about the six days. When you were all alone, no watched I were a kiss in the sky. Well, I was barely a glimmer in my young daddy's eyes. I said that we're so tired of hearing about the six days. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. Thank you. Love you. Dave won pork.